Hello. Thank you. Um, Nicholas Rose suggests that in a neoliberal society, one of the fundamental tasks of control workers, including the police, social workers, and healthcare professionals, is to identify the riskiness of individuals, actions, forms of life, and territories. Though hardly a coherent political program, neoliberalism in its broadest sense refers to civic withdrawal or to the reappraisal or diminishing of the role of government responsibility especially with regard to impoverished classes. These governing practices tend to result in the increasing criminalization of social problems, the withdrawal of services from those who fail to espouse mainstream norms such as sobriety and participation in the legal la uh, labor market and private property regime, and an emphasis on a discourse of individual responsibility. Neoliberal logic presumes that with hard work, anyone should be able to overcome adversity. It places a moral component on success. And by insisting that only the immoral fail to achieve success, it permits and even encourages elites to blame the poor for crime, poverty, and violence. Because people are responsible for their own fates as individuals, neoliberalism further entails that a state should not interfere with this process, since doing so would be counterintuitive to the basic premise that only merit should determine success. success. The calculation of risk is also a central governmental technology of actuarial justice a juridical style that is mainly renowned for its introduction of new consequences for sentencing, but which also underpins crime prevention strategies, policing, and reflects a specific politics closely associated with conservative brands of neoliberalism. Actuarial justice aims to impose sanctions that incapacitate offenders rather than transforming them. It works by removing from circulation the risks that, offender, that the offender represents. My article represents an attempt to confront a way of thinking, a means of governing relationships that shapes all our lives, because the success of neoliberal power is proportional to its ability to hide its own mechanisms. The idea is to deconstruct and thereby to help to eliminate a power knowledge base that has become the norm. I try to do this by demonstrating that neoliberalist logic is socially constructed and not genetically determined or divinely inspired. I explore how the construct of at-risk youth is filtered through a number of discursive configurations, namely through different methods for creating knowledge, anthropological, sociological, and excuse me, criminological, the types of expertise they give rise to and the practices of intervention they constitute. In the article, I argue that contemporary practices of calculating, managing, and storing the disordered, I mean uh, youth who disrupt the orderly functioning of the market, have created some of the needs for, and many of the limits on, critical protective factors that mitigate against gang involvement, namely Aboriginal community realizing initiatives. Moreover, the supplanting of nonprofits collectivizing function by an auditing one comes at great human cost, as the organizations invest ever more of their resources in meeting accounting and other visibility demands, and less in actual service provision. In a neoliberal justice regime, at-risk individuals are threats who place in jeopardy the ideals of peace and good governance, on which Canadian order has historically been predicated. They also challenge the responsibilizing rationale that brings the desired entrepreneurial citizen into being. The greater the potential for violence and property offenses, it would seem, the greater the threat. Crime statistics aid in the assessing of young, outwardly violent Native men to be probable threats and impoverished inner city Aboriginal male youth with high vulnerabilities and complex needs have indeed become the newest arbiters of violent crime, surpassing every other count simultaneously of violent offenders and victims of violence. Lacking in social capital and possessing cultural attributes that are inimical to marketing, at-risk native youth are read as depleting resources within the political economy. As such, they are easily signified as a non or even a counterproductive class or as a risk community. 
Tough on crime advocates mobilize these alleged dangers to the proper functioning of the market to support policies that would increase incarceration rates in seeking to contain or minimize those who do not self-maximize in legally sanctioned ways, the state then works to remove from circulation the so-called problem population and pours heavy resources into institutions of segregation. This draws limited funds away from the efforts of nonprofit groups who seek to ameliorate the circumstances of those whose freedoms are not well served by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade alone. Although they may be safer locked up than on the street, youth detention centers are modeled more on livestock farming enterprises than on value-adding production facilities. Within these holding centers, youth receive little programming and instead are corralled in ranges until they are eventually discharged to the street, which for many is the equivalent of being offered up for slaughter. Their lack of success is apparently patently manifest in their poverty for it denotes a refusal to invest in the management, presentation, promotion, and enhancement of their own economic cap capital as a capacity of their selves and a lifelong project. This success aversion is indeed approached like a disease that may be transmitted from one generation to the next. This makes sociopolitical problems seem natural, producing a dangerously anti-progressive biological determinism. The contemporary imaginary of the plague in the city serves as a fertile repertoire for experimenting with notions of crime and disorder as infectious diseases. Winnipeg's inner city is repeatedly portrayed as plagued by social problems. The shift from crime to illness and from law enforcement to public health neoliberal governance indexes an important neoliberal movement. This shift resonates with a rising investment in what Foucault denotes as security, namely biopolitical pra bio practices for organizing circulation, eliminating its dangers, making a division between good and bad circulation, and maximizing the good circulation by eliminating the bad. The idea of the city under siege by contagious forces is employed to show how a previous concern with controlling territory morphs into a governmental concern with circulation. The movement of disorderly and dangerous elements becomes the focus for control, and marshalling these movements serves the purpose of creating security. However, as Gordon suggests, it is a characteristic and troubling property of neoliberalist logic to adhere to a form of political sovereignty whose concerns would be at once to totalize and to individualize. The totalizing managerial energies invested in native male youth are practiced alongside those that individualize and responsibilize native female youth. Because they do not pose serious security threats, aside from imperiling their cells, efforts equal to those made with relation to native male youth are not undertaken to circumscribe the movements of native girls and women on the street. Thus, although they retain greater capacities for circulation, capacities that gang members and other predators exploit, young native street women are disproportionately made to suffer the cruel indignities of callous neglect. Those among them who are homeless and mentally ill, or urban campers, as they are sometimes euphemized, are generally ill-equipped to take on their responsibilized roles. They may lack the capacity to engage such anticipatory technologies as risk protection and aversion. They may be unable to organize the diverse security assemblages that are necessary both to imagine and to cope with general uncertainty. Instead, they would seem to willfully defy rationalism and to embrace risk, whether through substance addictions or other illnesses, by engaging in dangerous street work, or simply by opting not to compete in consumerist society. As transient, poorly affiliated, and non-territorially aligned individuals, they represent forms of difference that are difficult to formulate in commodity terms. The Office of the Children's Advocate in Manitoba recently released a report on youth suicide. The report identified several patterns which suggest that the nature of youth suicide is changing in the province, with more young girls killing themselves than boys. 
The report examined 50 cases of, young, of youth suicide from 2009 to 2013 where, youth, where youths were in the care of Manitoba, Manitoba's Children and Family Services. The children's advocate identified six major commonalities among the deaths. These included poor school attendance, a history of hospitalization or for suspicious injuries or mental health crises, criminal justice involvement, suicidal ideation, a history of substance misuse by parents and or youth, and a significant history of residence changes. In general, unless they are caught committing offenses, most Canadian youth have a low statistical profile and are relatively invisible in policy debates. Like their counterparts in the youth detention centers, youth taken into care by social services attain an administrative identity that may provide greater statistical visibility. But this counting in fails to ameliorate other unmet needs, such as mental health therapy. The street is awash in young men and women who are perilously disaffiliated. Disorder and the people constructed as embodying disorder and as circulating improperly have become a central resource of political power. The law not only plays a central role in producing disorderly people, but in facilitating bad circulation and in assisting their social and economic exclusion. To conclude, as threats to, rather than resources within the political economy, Winnipeg native male youth are easily signified as a dangerous class, just as their ancestors were outlawed and contained to facilitate the proper circulation of goods, people, finances, technologies, and ideas that Canadian political and economic progress entrained over the course of the settlement era. New forms of public management, such as shipping, receiving, and warehousing youths in detention centers and hotels without proper human resources, are as counterproductive as is returning them to the families they perceive to have abused or neglected them. The displacing of residential care by pharmacare, the shift to community-based services, the mainstreaming of mental with general health care, and the greater reliance on civil society institutions such as the family and markets have together contributed to the production of street youth risk and to the circumstances which permit an auto-annihilation of the unsheltered and mentally ill populations more generally. The extraordinarily high rate of Aboriginal male youth incarceration in Manitoba confirms that Aboriginal male youth are the most managed aggregate group of young offenders in the province and serves as a reminder that the colonial project of classifying and removing improperly circulating persons or pollutants from spaces reserved for legitimate commerce is far from a distant memory then as today, this serves the purpose of surveillance, confinement, and control. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also uh, to Karen and to the members of the journal for their hard work on this issue.